Hola, Rubén. Hola, Ana. ¿Cómo estás? Ah, estoy bien. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. Gracias. Ah, very nice to see you today, Rubén. Very nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So to, today my guest is Rubén Ruiz. He's principal applied scientist at Amazon Web Services and full professor of statistics and OR on leave of absence at the Polytechnic University of Valencia in Spain. He's co-author of more than 100 papers in international journals and has participated in presentations of more than 200 papers in national and international conferences. He's editor-in-chief of the journal Operation Research Perspectives and co-editor of the European Journal of Industrial Engineering. He's also associate editor of other journals like TOP and member of the editorial boards of several journals, most notably EJOR and CNOR. His research interests include scheduling and routing in real-life scenarios, as well as cloud computing scheduling. Ruben, uh, once again, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. It's an honor to have you here. Pleasure is mine. <laughs> well, let's, let's start. Um, I know you have studied and worked in Valencia, uh, but were you born there as well? Yeah, I was born in Valencia, raised in Valencia, studied here in Valencia. Yeah. Nice. Uh, is your family from Valencia as well? No, no. Uh, my parents are from different parts of, of Spain, but they immigrated to Valencia when I was very, very young. But I was already born. Yeah. Right. Uh, and what did your parents do for a living? My father is an economist. and My mother, I think I can describe her as an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but uh, did, did, did your father act as an economist, uh, as his main job, or he had other activity? He was an economist for a while, but then he joined my mother, my mother in, in their ventures. And yeah, ah, so they we'll had a company. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, ah, they okay, a company. Okay. Ah. So, uh, any hermanos? Yes, I have two brothers. I'm the middle one. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I see that you were born in 1976, uh, and that's more or less at the end of the dictatorship regime in Spain. Uh, do you think that had any impact in your upbringing? Uh, not really. Uh, for my parents, surely they did. And yeah, um, before that, for example, my, my grandfather, my my. That uh, my mother's dad was in prison, sentenced to death. <laughs> so uh, I could feel it when I was little that we were coming out of something bad, but I didn't really get to feel it. By when I was a teen, middle 80s, that was already distant. Uh -huh. But did your uh, grandfather uh, get killed or did he escape? No, he was sentenced to death and stayed in prison for a long time, but then he was pardoned and he could leave. Uh, thankfully, ah. he could leave uh, in ah. jail. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah, good. Yeah. Um, how did you spend your time in Valencia uh, when you were young? Ah, just like every other kid, playing, soccer, bike, <laughs> no worries, <laughs> no deadlines, yeah. no papers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, any interest in sports? I started running when I was very young, uh, and then I uh, I was running in in a federated team uh, and all the way up to the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, was it like short distance running, long distance? I was actually not bad at any distance, but not good at any distance either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like like the jack of all trades. I could run the two mile or I could run half marathons and I could sneak in in a 400 relay if the, the speed runners were absent for some reason. <laughs> wow, so super flexible. <laughs> yeah, let's call it mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you seem to have a strong personality. Um, that's my impression at least. Was this reflected okay. in the type of music you used to enjoy listening during your youth? Yeah, if that's a good indicator, then I have a very strong personality then. Yeah, I like hard rock. 
very hard rock, heavy metal. Over the years, I started liking all kinds of music, but as a as a teenager, I liked very hard music, Metallica, uh -huh. Venom. Yeah. Nice. Any favorite bands? <laughs> Yeah, I used to enjoy a lot Metallica and Megadeth when I was teen. Uh, Iron Maiden was also a good band. Yeah, and then Spanish hard rock, Baron Rojo, mm -hmm. New. Yeah, my parents didn't enjoy that part of my personality back then. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have long hair and things like that? Yeah. I'm, I'm losing it now, but uh -huh. I, I used to have long hair, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. Uh, please find a photo and send it to me later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so did you enjoy going to school? Uh, I can't say I did. I was often bored at school. Didn't really enjoy any particular subject. Uh, yeah. Is there, is there I, any reason behind that? Uh, fact? I don't really know. For example, I used to hate math, but then at university I rediscovered math. So I don't know why I hated math back <laughs> then. So I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, did you take part of any exchange program in high school? Yeah, I used to take on different exchange programs. I did exchange program to Denmark. Then we had same students from US. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much everything I could. My mother was obsessed with me learning English, which at that time I didn't really appreciate. But yeah, my, my mother is always right, even when she's not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now I have come to appreciate her, her efforts in, in us trying to learn English. Yeah. So you went to the US. Uh, I did my last year of high school in U.S. Uh -huh. In U.S. system, that's 12th grade. So I went to deep America in, up uh, in between Pennsylvania and Northwest uh, New York. And what are your best memories from that period in the U.S.? Uh, I had a very nice year. I, I was in track and field and cross country uh, teams. And I was a good runner at that time. Uh -huh. I found that they had very nice and devoted teachers and professors there. I enjoyed math there. I enjoyed English. It was different level. Mm -hmm. It was much more involved. Like the high school was a little, like a little town with everybody being involved in so many things at the same time. Much, much different from high school in, in purely academic. Mm. I found it very, very engaging and interesting. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a nice year. Right. Did you enroll yourself in any side activities other than attending classes? Yeah, I was in the cross country and track and field uh, teams. Mm -hmm. And I was also uh, uh, doing also lots of, I started doing lots of uh, computer science, well, not computer science, computing oriented type of uh, clubs. Uh, okay. Is it true that you learn how to drive there? Yes, I, I learned. <laughs> I, I got my driving license in US uh -huh. and some, somehow got it transferred in Spain without doing any exam. <laughs> ah, very good. Uh, any particular reason for choosing a computer engineering degree and why did you not stay in the US for college? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I got an offer uh, because I got good grades in high school there. And I got an offer to, to stay in US. But at that time, I was very much into computers and computers, computer science engineering. We call that in, in Spain. It's, it's not really computer science. It's not, it's not computer engineering. It's something like in the middle. And I was really interested in going back uh, the university where I stayed later had a very good reputation. So uh, I came back. Problem is that we have university admission exams in May. And in May, the, the course was not over in the United States. So I had to wait and take the admission exam in September. 
which I passed it, but at that time, the university courses for computer science engineering were full. So I had to wait one full year when I came back. Ah, okay. And, and what were your main activities uh, at that time? I mean, you were not a, 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 at the university, so you probably uh, found mm -hmm. uh, uh, some activity to keep yourself busy, I suppose. Yeah, this is something not too many people know, but before actually going to US, I actually started working during summers and during school holidays. My parents at that time uh, uh, put together a company, I started a company as a nursing home. And I started working before going to US in a nursing home. So when I came back, I got a degree for working in a nursing home. And that year before joining the university, I just worked in the nursing home. Wow, and what did you do there? Well, I was taking care of our clients, the, the elderly. So most of the uh, elderly people living in nursing homes are, are very old and they require a lot of care. So cleaning them, showering them. Feeding them. Uh, Feeding them, yeah, well, just, just yeah, that kind of that's, work. That's quite unexpected. Uh, I could not see that coming. <laughs> very, <laughs> very interesting. Um, and, and did you keep working at the nursing home after starting university? Yeah, the, it, my, well, my, my smaller brother was too young, but my older brother and me, we had to work in the nursing home because the, the financial economical situation in my family required that so uh, i started university and i was working in the nursing home and i was working in the night shift wow because it's the the only the only shift that was actually compatible with me attending the university so how many hours you used to sleep in those days uh not many <laughs> uh i started working every day from Sunday included. So the night of Sunday, all the way up to the night of Thursday, I started working at 10 p.m. all the way up to 8 a.m. in the morning. Wow. And then you went straight so, to university? Yeah, I took my motorcycle at that time and I went straight from work to the university. That's Actually, crazy. some if I had a very early hour class in the morning, I would not arrive on time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Did you used to sleep during classes? Ah, that's a good question also. Uh, I had, if the class was very boring, I remember a professor just switching off the lights so that the beamer could be seen. Mm -hmm. And then the class was half dark and then I would sit in the last row and, and yeah, falsely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But for then I got used to it. Uh, humans are extremely resilient. You get used to anything. So I would probably sleep very little during during the week, then sleep 10 hours straight <laughs> uh -huh. in the weekend, mm -hmm. every night in the weekend and, and recover to recover. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you had some boring classes. Did you find the classes at the university? less boring compared to school? Uh, I'm sorry to say that most classes were, I just found them too theoretical. I was expecting a more hands-on kind of computer engineering type of studies. And everything was math, theoretical computer science, and very, very, I don't want to say boring, just disconnected from from practice so not very um, exciting perhaps yeah it's over the years i've learned that many of the things that were taught to us were only useful as brain exercises mm -hmm. but then i had to learn most of the applied and real real between quotes things after after going to university so uh, yeah, nah, that, not not very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens quite often. Did that change when you discovered OR? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I had it was five years of uh, studies. 
because at that time, bachelors and masters were together in, in Spain. The, the separation between bachelors and masters was after my time. So in my third year, I have two excellent teachers, uh, Antonio Loba and Pilar Tormos. They taught me operation research, a course. And that's when my, my something clicked in my mind because I started seeing the many potential applications of the things we were doing at class. And that's, yeah, that's where the fun started in my opinion. <laughs> Do you think it was a sort of a revelation? I don't know if it's, it was, if there was the, the, I was at the right moment, at the right time, you know, uh -huh. I don't know. I was at that time, for example, we were having problems at the nursing home, trying to come up with the roster mm -hmm. because it was a very complicated problem because we have to cover different people 24, seven, 30, 365. And then, you know, people have to work for eight hours and then. My mother was trying to solve this problem by hand and, and asked me, can you help me out? Then I discovered that there were many options possible. And at that time I was taking the course and this was this chapter about scheduling, labor scheduling. And I said, well, I, I can solve this problem with these techniques. So it was the first time that I could actually see something that I was studying at the university that could actually solve a real problem. That's excellent. Uh, do you think that the fact that you were working made you appreciate the value of OR more clearly? I think so, yes, because uh, I had to work very hard, as we mentioned, not too much sleep, so hard labor. And then I was ex I was trying to get some value out of all the time I was also spending in class, right? Mm -hmm. So I was expecting, OK, compilers, interesting, What what is this? helping or parallel programming. OK, that's very interesting. This algorithm to keep the cache memory coherent between different processors is it, what is this? How is this helping me out? Right. Uh -huh. And then I go to operation research. Oh, if you have a problem that looks like this, you can solve it like like with this algorithm. Right. And then uh -huh. I go, oh, OK, that's something that I can actually use. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So you have this applied nature in you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I discovered that I like the the more applied part of, of, of everything, right? If I mm -hmm. can apply something to complex hard problems, then I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Other people like more the theory and the lemmas and the theorems and so on. Mm -hmm. And I completely respect that. And I also value that. But it's not what keeps me uh, moving. Right. Uh... Did you have to do any research project in the final year? Yes, uh, I had this course on operation research and then I took a second course, which was not mandatory, it was an opt optional course. And then I met my, what she will become later, my PhD supervisor. Uh -huh. And to pass this second course, I had to do like a course project. And I took this, this, this problem of doing the roster uh, on, on the nursing home in this second course and I really really enjoyed so then I had to do what we used to call a final career project at that time so it's kind of a master thesis you will refer to that as a master thesis today and for that I I had this this person Concha Maroto another very well-known professor in OR in Spain and I took her uh, as a supervisor for my for this project. And I took a project in a real company that was producing animal feed. And, and it was a, a routing problem. So I got to learn a lot of things and, and we solved a, a real vehicle routing problem at that time. Uh, I had lots of fun. Later, we published that in a paper when I was already a PC student. But at that time, we, we finished that project, yes. Very good. Uh, was OR popular among your colleagues at that time? Not at all. Not at all. I was a complete black sheep. Uh, we all are, who, I think. <laughs> I think so. I, uh, the, it's like the OR people never really fit anywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. It was a completely unpopular choice among my peers. 
mostly no students will do a, P, uh, a project, a final career project on OR. So it was really, really something out of the ordinary, yes. Mm -hmm. What did you do after graduating? After graduating, it, I graduated in year 2000. So, you know, the year 2000 effect. So it was like a very hot year. Everybody was working at the last year in university. I stopped working at the nursing home and I went to, to IT consulting. The companies were just hiring by the boatloads. I, I worked for less than a year and I dreaded every single day. It's, it was horrible. I did not look. I, I was missing the, the aura kind of thing. Uh -huh. I was coding apps and doing forms and that was boring as hell. So I went back to the university. I was offered a grant to do the PhD with the same professor I did the final with this Concepcion Maroto professor. Uh -huh. And I went back to the university and started a PhD. I see. Uh, what was your PhD about? So it was also very applied. My, my, my supervisor just gave me a business card from a person she knew. It was a CEO of a ceramic tile manufacturer. There is a big cluster of ceramic tile producers at the north of, of, of Valencia region. So I went there with my car and I met this person and they explained to me all the problems they had at the factory. And most of the problems were machine scheduling problems. So I started doing a PhD on machine scheduling. Ah, so was uh, at that time where you started working on flow shop scheduling and related problems? Yeah, well, the problem was a very sophisticated hybrid flow shop scheduling problem with lots of side constraints. But then we started, okay, we, we modeled the problem, but then we started from the very simple variant, which is a flow shop scheduling problem. And then we built from there, making the problem more complicated until we solved the, the, the more sophisticated problem. And what methods you use to solve the, these problems? Yeah, well, at that time, well, the ma machine scheduling problems I mean, beyond single machine, parallel machine, and some very specific flow shop problems are notoriously sophisticated. So, well, sophisticated is not the word, hard. <laughs> hard to solve to optimality, right? So mm -hmm. we had to use heuristics. And at that time, meta heuristics were fashionable and among them genetic algorithms. So we started and applied most of the time genetic algorithms during the PhD, yeah. Uh -huh. Not pure genetic algorithms. We started, I mean, at that time, I already discovered that it was not really the genetic population side of things that was really working, but the local search, local search yeah. that was really working. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, were you obsessed at times when coding and running experiments during your PhD? Yeah, I was very busy because at that time it was very common in the Spanish universities. They were growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. So they will just hire you as an assistant professor. And I was also teaching at the same time I was doing my PhD. So that was very busy period. But at, at that time, and for all the PhD students that might be hearing us, take advantage of that time because you only have a single thread as regards your research, right? You're focused on your PhD looks difficult, looks daunting, looks like a lot of things to do, but that's nothing compared to what will come afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really obsessed. I would probably, I was launching experiments manually, right? Uh -huh. And I was really, really eager to see the results of experiments. So I would put the alarm clock at 4 a.m. in the morning because I was calculating that at that time the, the experiments will be finished. And I couldn't wait to to wake up. So I would go and, and see what the experiments, what, what's the output of the experiments. It's very nice when you are getting results and you see that your research is is, is given the, the, the outcomes everybody expects. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice feeling. Yeah, I can totally relate. And it, it seems that you were describing my own PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, you had a job uh already when you finished your phd right mm -hmm. yeah i was 
uh, yeah, as I said, I was hired as an assistant at the university. Now, nowadays, it is very difficult to, to teach without a PhD. It's not impossible, but the landscape has changed. But at that time, the university was growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Every year in my department, which was a statistics and OR department, uh, like six people would join. Wow. Uh, so the, the department will grow, would grow six, eight percent, ten percent per mm -hmm. year because there were so many students and so many classes to teach. So it was very, it was very normal to, for the la late comers to be doing their PhD at the same time they were teaching. So I, ha I just had to stay. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, to move to another university or, or, or anything. Mm -hmm. And how was the popularity of OR among the young students by the time you finished your PhD? And how to make OR more interesting to the <laughs> students? Yeah, again, I was a black sheep. There were not that many. Because in, in Spain, OR is together with the statistics. For some random reason, I don't really understand to this point. Well, I, I know. I know the reason. It's, it's by some backwards law in the middle 80s that these two small things were left over and they didn't want to make two areas, so they put them together. So in my department, most of the people were doing a PhD. Most of the PhD students were PhDs on, on statistics, not OR. So again, I was, I was a black sheep also. <laughs> uh -huh. and... How to make OR more interesting? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to start throwing punches away. I, I think OR, if you go to the history of OR, and Blackett Circus and, and all these things we teach our students or started like a very, very applied kind of mathematic, mathematics joins computer science kind of thing. But then we quickly made it to academic, in my opinion. And we have a, at least partially, I don't want to say lost our way, but people are now publishing in ever increasingly academic problems and we have forgotten that there are problems out there that at companies that require us to solve them and some other people are doing it so yeah if we want to make OR more interesting in my most humble opinion please nobody get upset would be let's go back to solving more real problems we can still do lots of theoretical stuff theory is important theory is fundamental, but it is also important to solve the real problems out there. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about uh, teaching simplex algorithm and uh, mm -hmm. teaching about duality theory at the undergrad level? I have a very strong opinion about that. I mean, if we had all the hours to teach the algorithms and the modeling and the applications, I would happily do both. But I think in my, again, in my most humble opinion and in my experience, it is a big mistake if you only have time for one, stay on the algorithms. Because how good is teaching how the simplex works and the big M method and the two-phase method and the upper bound method if the students don't ever get to really understand what's the use of that? So I tend to remember when I was a student at the university that they would teach me a lot of theoretical stuff and, and not really. And then my colleagues will go, oh, but then they go on modeling and they don't know what's going underneath. And yeah, I get in my car and I hit a button and the car starts and I drive. I, yeah, I know there is something going in thermodynamics inside the engine and the gasoline burning, but I don't really know the equations that go burn, how those things work and I still drive, right? Uh -huh. And everybody drives and only a very small fraction of engineers, very, very small, tiny fraction know how the engine actually works. So if you're going to work in a Formula One engine manufacturing company, yes, you need to know the simplex. Otherwise, do you really know, need to know how to iterate in the simplex algorithm? Uh -huh. So yeah, I think we should teach more modeling less algorithmics at the undergrad level if you don't have the time to do both. Do you have a similar opinion about uh, branch and bound and branch and cut methods um, at the undergraduate level? 
I mean, how many hours do you need as a professor to really have a student understand the branch and bounding? And for the students to understand that a linear relaxation is solved at every node, and then depending on the variables that should be integral or not, and then you, that's a lot of, that's a lot of hours. That's many hours. Why do we care? All, all the students need to know is try to define the least number of binary and integer variables because what happens underneath is they're more complicated to solve. There you go. Model. Let's start model. Let's start solving problems. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to explain branch and bound at the underground level? But Again, this is a personal and I know contentious uh, opinion, but that's my opinion and you're asking. So I, yeah, I yeah, give yeah. my opinion. No, no, please, <laughs> please continue. I'm enjoying it actually. Uh, but if one wants to interpret the log of a solver, uh, I mean, uh, they will of course see the solver as a black box, but then you'll see uh, the log appearing on their screen and the gap um, and, you know, best bound and things like that. Uh, is it uh, the fact that you don't teach uh, some of the basics, don't you think it might uh, affect the level of interpretability of someone that is just using the solver uh, <sighs> blindly? It's again, unpopular opinion. People in machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science will start using clustering algorithms. Those are black boxes and they teach their students how to interpret the result and how to apply the algorithm. End of the story. You use app solver. All you have to tell the students is, look, if it says optimal, this is optimal. If it says not optimal, then you have to look at this, which is called the gap. And the gap is in percentage. And it's just basically in the worst case where the optimal solution is, is, is going to be. But you don't know. What else do you need to, to tell them at the undergrad level? Uh -huh. I mean, if you want to go deeper, then you, you start getting into duality, then you have to explain them the linear relaxation and yeah, but undergrads, how many, how many operation research hours do you have? 60, 30, 45 mm -hmm. in class? Mm -hmm. Let's be realistic. If we explain those things in class, we don't have time for, for modeling mm -hmm. and then what, what, what's the use of knowing duality and, and and branch and bound if you if the students haven't learned to model what what, what is that we are solving <laughs> so yeah yeah you're you're mentioning about uh you know the the, the applied side of OR that is something that we may have forgotten over the years at least uh, us in academia uh when it comes to teaching um and i mean did you collaborate with companies uh also uh all you only focus on research and teaching. Yeah, that since I told you that's that was my experience for my final career. So before entering the PhD, I did a project with a company that was producing animal feed. So and I really like the oh, this is a problem we haven't been able to solve. And, and you can solve it and you can solve it with optimality guarantees or you can solve it approximately, but you can see how much value that is bringing, right? Mm -hmm. Then in my PhD, I also solved this uh, complex scheduling problem for ceramic tile manufacturers. So I did a lot of work with companies while I was in academia. I, I was trying to, it was for several reasons. First, to get additional money to pay PhD students because the, the academic uh, world in Spain is, not as rosy as as people would expect. There are the projects funded by the government, either at the local, regional or national level, are really lacking in funds. So for us at the research group, working with companies was a good source of revenue. And at the same time, it was a very nice source of very interesting and varied problems to work on. So I work with distribution companies. I work for big, large retail uh, companies. I work for many different industries in different sectors, mm -hmm. from car manufacturing to uh, metal manufacturing or 
furniture manufacturing, ceramic tile manufacturers, all the way up to the Spanish army. We did a project oh. for the Spanish army. So it's a wide range of applied projects. Did you build and, yeah. and sell software uh, in yeah. some of these projects? At some point, we had so much activity with companies that uh, I got involved with a research institute. It's called the ET. It's called basically Technological Institute of Informatics, which is a research association with lots of activity at companies. So I had this multi-pronged approach. So I was doing research, I was teaching, and I was doing what we call, I don't know, in English will be research transfer uh -huh. through this institute. And it was just easier to do things through this institute than through the university because of all the paperwork. So I understand this is this institute is a private entity. Mm -hmm. So the institute can sign contracts with companies much faster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm than agreements with the university that take months to, to yes, sign. Yes, and yes, like we that. have a similar experience around here. I understand completely. Yeah, so we had, we could hire more flexibly uh -huh. engineers to do the coding and we developed several software packages and some of them are still being sold to companies today. I'm not that much involved anymore mm -hmm. because once the, the software becomes mature and there is no longer so much need to work on the algorithmic core. Mm -hmm. And it's all about different windows and reading data and, and all these things, which I'm not really that much interested. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, tell me about your main research endeavors of the last 20 years, uh, most notably uh, your work on flow shop scheduling. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very interesting. I was a bit lost at the beginning during the PhD because you go to an industry and you see lots of machines, lots of manufacturing lines, lots of things going on. And it's not so easy at that time with the limited knowledge that I have, that I had to map those real problems into simple machine scheduling problems, right? Mm -hmm. So I was quite lost for a time reading lots of papers. And then I found the very famous paper by Navas et al. on NEH heuristic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was the first paper I completely understood from the, from the beginning to the end uh. as a PhD. And I thought, oh, this is very simple. I can code this. So, so I coded it. And then that was the start. Oh, but this is only for the flow shop. My problem here at the company is much more complicated. I need to extend this. So that's how I started. Mm -hmm. More or less, yeah. Right. Uh, you mentioned that you found a paper that you could actually understand what was going on and replicate a method. Uh, sometimes, and I think more often than not, it's actually not the case, right? When it comes to optimization algorithms. Yeah, I found that part of our field at that time when I was doing the PhD particularly intriguing. For example, not being able to reproduce results. Already for, for the flow shop problem, there are some notorious algorithms that nobody has been actually able to reproduce results for. And I found that at that time very unnerving. So that's why probably consciously or unconsciously I was biased towards simple algorithms. Because when I was working with the companies, I had a meeting uh, in a ceramic tile manufacturer and and there was a very, very seasoned person. Like he was not knowing anything I was talking about optimization wise, but he told me something that I still remember to this day. Look, when you're not here, I will still be using this algorithm. I need to understand what this is doing because my job is on the line, not yours. So if I don't understand what this thing is doing, I will not be using it. So that's one thing and another thing is that we tend to forget that the algorithms we do in operation research have to be coded and have to be maintained and we tend to and this is one of the things from my uh, computer science background i value which is coding an algorithm if you take the the cycle the life cycle of of computer science or software 
1% of the time and money, it's coding first time. 99% is maintaining that thing. So if you have a very complex algorithm, first people are not going to be able to understand it, so they will not probably trust it. And secondly, who's going to maintain that, right? So mm -hmm. simple methods, if they work, have much m many more advantages compared to utterly sophisticated things. But we have a problem, in my opinion, in, in our field as regards that. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, uh, so how was your quest uh, when it came to developing uh, simple algorithms uh, over the years? Yeah. So during my PhD, I, I found out that actually not doing genetic algorithms, almost any genetic algorithm and doing local search was actually giving good results. And then I got in contact with a well-known professor in heuristics, it's Thomas Stutzle. He was working at that time in, in Darmstadt in Germany. Then he moved to, to the ULB in Brussels in Belgium. And I got in contact with him because he had a, a unpublished paper. It was, it was a technical report about an ILS, I did a local search algorithm for the flow shop, which I was able to reproduce and the results were excellent much better than other published methods. So I, I wrote an email to him, how come this is not published? And he told me I had, I, I, I got sick of trying to convince referees that this thing was working because it's so simple. And then I said, I want to work with you. So he invited me to, to Darmstadt and then I, need, I did that stay with him. And then I visited him twice when he was in Brussels for, for three years. And we developed together what was, I th it's the paper that has the most, the highest number of citations. It's not probably my best paper, but mm -hmm. it's the one that it has the most citations, which is the I2 greedy algorithm for, for the flow shop problem, which later turned out that it was a reinvented kind of thing because it's a very simple uh, kind of algorithm. It's a ruin and recreate algorithm, basically. Right. Yeah, it's a ring and recreate. It has very many similarities with iterated local search, yeah. many similarities with grasp. It's, it's just you have a solution, remove some elements, greedily reinsert them yeah. using a very good heuristic and iterate over that. No memory, just local search, no operators, very simple, one or two parameters at most. And turns out it works beautifully. It works very fast and basically you have many iterations per unit of time because it's a very simple algorithm yes yes and, and that gets better results than much more elaborated constructs and it, it's a very simple algorithm that you can explain to to non-experts and very easy to code very easy to maintain very easy to extend to other problems and that was for a long time my main research line yeah. doing simple algorithms for for real problems that's exactly the reason uh, why I worked with uh, ILS, Iterator Local Search, uh, for so many years is because of its simplicity and flexibility and also relatively easy to implement and most importantly to explain. Uh, do you think that our community tends to value more complicated ideas than simple ones? Oh, if I, if I had a euro every time a referee said to me, oh, there is not enough contribution in this paper because the method is overly simple. Uh, there is no problem specific knowledge in the algorithm. And, and I, I, it got to a point that I had a template for answering referees. Really? Because I got always, or most of the time with small variations, the same complaints. And then I would go, I, I would push back saying, why is that a problem? I am showing with comprehensive computational studies, which I'm forced to do because otherwise I will not convince you that the algorithm is actually better than other re-implementations that I did. And at the same time, it's simpler. And at the same time, it does not require problem-specific knowledge to get better results. Why adding problem-specific knowledge if you don't need it? It's a requirement for publishing. I understand if the problem is too complicated, if everything you tried has failed, what is the next thing you do? Well, let's try to add cuts. Let's try to, let's try to demonstrate that the cuts are facets and 
on all this very, very hard stuff. But why do that from the beginning if you don't need it? Right. Uh -huh. So it, it was very difficult at the beginning. But then I, I managed to publish a few papers and then I was I was just able to pull it off with just by citing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Very good strategy. Uh, do you feel that certain authors unnecessarily complicate some methods just to impress the reviewers and increase their chance to have the paper accepted? I, th I, I strongly believe so. And I think that's a bias that we have. And I have been able to take algorithms published by other authors I have coded their algorithm from from one end to the other and I have realized how removing part of the algorithm and focusing on the local search would result in better algorithms so what is happening is that we are over complicating things to please referees to increase our chances of getting papers published by obfuscating uh, sometimes and I'm of course, I'm generalizing, and sometimes you just you need you need to do these things because you do a simple local search, that thing doesn't work, and then you have to bring their artillery. But my question is, why bring the artillery if all you need is is you know this thing to slap flies, right? Uh -huh. It's it's you don't need you don't need artillery to kill a fly, right? Yes, 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 yes. So. Right. So, Ruben. Uh... I would like to talk about one of your recent works also on scheduling. Uh, I saw that you co-authored uh, a paper on informed journal computing, uh, a very interesting one, uh, comparing mixed integer programming models against constraint programming models uh, for some s scheduling problems. Could you briefly comment about the findings of this work? Hey, it's an interesting question. For those listening, I didn't tell Anand about this, and the paper was very, very recently uh, accepted. So he is really sharp. <laughs> yeah, well, this is a very interesting paper and it, it, it connects the dots with my previous ramblings about publishing, uh, yeah, the research that is not following just the beaten path. So we have been observing for a long while already that constraint programming solvers have becoming very powerful to the point of beating, at least in scheduling, which is what we studied, right? Beating very clearly the state-of-the-art mathematical solvers like Cplex and Gurovi. So we tried to publish this, we got rejected, then we expanded to more scheduling problems, we got rejected again, and then we end up studying like 11 or 12 different scheduling problems from very simple ones to very sophisticated. We took all the state-of-the-art mathematical uh, models proposed for each one of these models, and then we coded them in Cplex and, and Gurovi, and then we coded them in CP Optimizer and also Google Google OR tools, and we made a very huge comparison, took a lot of, lot of work. And the, the result is that in almost all of the problems, constraint programming works much better than, than mathematical programming. But again, as we were discussing before, we got all the complaints from the referees. Oh, you are just evaluating a bunch of models. There's nothing new here. What do you mean there's nothing new? Everybody is assuming that the best exact tools are branch and bound and mathematical solvers. And this is probably no longer true, at least in the scheduling. What, what, what do you mean? There is no contribution, right? Uh -huh. Of course, I'm biased. I think there is a contribution, but this is what we were discussing before, that we have to move back to the impactful, non-incremental type of research. This research is very risky and it's very difficult to publish it. But then as a scientist, I feel much better when this kind of work gets published in the end, right? But then it took us two, three years to, to get the paper, five revisions in Inform's Journal of Computing. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Wow. But yeah, that's, that's the contribution uh, on that piece. Very happy to, to work with, with Bachmann and Bahit, uh, my two co-authors on that yeah. piece. I think that's a very relevant work. It drew me attention immediately, just by the title. And then I went through the abstract, and then uh, I had a quick glimpse um, of the paper. And uh, it seems really uh, relevant. And also, it provides useful information or the community. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is overlooked because it might not look as fancy as one may expect, 
but uh, uh, I, I see uh, uh, value in that work and I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so you were mentioning about publications, so we've been discussing about papers. Uh, so let's talk about your editorial activity. Uh, you co-founded the European Journal of Industrial Engineering, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, during this, this uh, scheduling work, I got in touch with Ali Alaverdi. He's a, a Kurdish author. He was working in Kuwait University at that time. And he's very famous for his work on review papers, on, on setup time, yes. scheduling. And I, he I has, think it's part uh, three already or something, right? Three or four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in touch with him also because, yeah, and we work in a few papers together. And then he went like, oh, there is not a very good uh, journal on scheduling, engineering, kind of. And then we, we created back in 2004. Five, I visited him in Kuwait, and and yeah, and we put together a new journal proposal, and we managed to find a, a lesser editor at that time, editorial house, and we started publishing the journal. And a few years later, we managed to get the impact factor for this journal, and it has been going more or less good from that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, associated with InterScience. Correct. Yeah, the publisher was in their science. We tried all the publishers at that time, but it was a period in which editorial houses were shrinking, not expanding. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to find a publisher for it. But in their science, uh, listened to us and they gave us good liberty to, to make our own editorial team. And it has worked very nicely. It's three editors. It's Ali, it's Jose Framiñan from Seville University in Spain also, and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you're also editor-in-chief of OR Perspectives. Uh, would you like to comment about the aims and scope of the journal? Yeah, that's that's an uh, interesting take. Elsevier got in touch with me, I think it was 2012, 2013. Uh, it was well before MDPI and, and Bentham and <laughs> Indawi. It was when Elsevier was starting the open access movement. And they make a very interesting proposal, which was creating an open access only journal at that time. It was difficult, but two years ago, we got our first impact factor. And now the journal is in the second quartile and it's doing nicely. It's a very broad journal. It was supposed to be as broad as eJour, but uh, open access. Mm -hmm. But then things change a bit and all the journals are transitioning to, to open access slowly. So, so I don't know now. I think it's probably competition, EJOR or PR competition, but probably it's, it's a different tier. EJOR is like our flagship journal, right? In Elsevier, uh -huh. Computer San OR, EJOR, uh -huh. and probably ORP, it's right below it. Uh -huh. So it's, it's a very broad. The aims and scope is everything OR related. It's, it's acceptable. Right. Uh, you have to pay a fee to, to publish in the journal? Yes, it's a full open access. So there is, there is no possibility to, to publish closed source. So everything is, is open access and it's a fully electronic journal. So we don't, ha we don't have the issues. So we just have a volume per year. And as soon as a paper is accepted, it's published online. It's, there is no paper from the beginning. So it was a risky proposition when the journal started, because who wants to, when the journal started, there were no agreements, editorial agreements like we have now, transformative agreements. So, so and, and nobody was uh, used to the open access. Uh -huh. So people were really surprised. Oh, I have to pay to publish? Uh -huh. Yes, but then everybody can read your paper once it's published, because it's not behind a paywall. Uh -huh. But it was very difficult at the beginning, very, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, but don't you think that uh, those that are uh, in places where they cannot afford paying uh, uh, to publish their work might yeah. af negatively affect them? Yeah, there is a program within Elsevier. It's called Research for Life, where the four is, is a number, Research 
for life, mm -hmm. where they basically waive the fee if the publication, the main corresponding author of the paper comes from a developing country that doesn't have transformative agreements or that uh, Elsevier, well, it's a long list of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how Elsevier comes with this list, but it's, it's, it maps very nicely with our thoughts of what is a third world country or a developing country where authors don't have access to pay the, the fees. Yeah. So, and that, that together with the transformative agreements with which many, many countries are signing in the last few years, it's removing the issue. And I think it's a, it's a better world because the research is open mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. including people from companies, anybody just Googling from the paper will get the paper. Otherwise you need a subscription to the journal and yeah. I think it's a more democratic uh, access to science. Yes, yes. But yeah, but somebody has to pay the cost. Exactly. And this creates problems. Yes. Yeah, it, it looks uh, interesting. Uh, and, you know, to have democratic access to papers is something very relevant. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you said, it comes with a price. Uh, and my concern is basically um, uh, the authors of uh, those countries that uh, cannot really uh, afford uh, the fees and so it might uh, be a, a sort of a double sword uh, uh, thing, you know, so. Uh, we have been looking closely at Sevier at the, at the numbers, at the submission rates, and the rates are not very different from other journals mm -hmm. that don't have open access fees. And every time we have had an author that had problems coming up with the APC without article processing charges, I've been able to waive the fee or to work something without severe. So, uh, of course, I don't have numbers for people that refrain from sending papers because they couldn't afford it. Uh -huh. But we don't have a fewer number of submissions from those countries than EJOR, for example. Okay. So I think, I think it's working okay, but I am obviously biased <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of as the editor of the journal, but yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Do you have any interesting anecdotes to share related to your editorial activity? Oh, I have a folder full of love letters from authors that are so unhappy about the reviewing process. Uh, it's something that people don't realize. It's like an author being really, really mad at me because he submitted his paper two months ago and he doesn't have an answer. And then I go to the reviewer performance of this person. Yes. And then uh, I, I see that this person declined 15 invitations and only accepted three of them. And the average time to provide a report was four months. So. I have many, many things like that, like, what are you talking about? Every time I have invited you, you have been so awfully late. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like when we are referees, we can be as late as we want. But when we are authors, we expect a very fast uh -huh. turnaround, right? Yeah. And then I get lots of complaints. Oh, but I can submit to this other publisher and they answer me in two weeks. I mean, in two weeks, I don't even have enough referees that have accepted to do review for free for your paper. So go submit elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, in two weeks, I cannot answer you in two weeks. If I answer you in two months, you will be probably around the median. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Ruben, uh, I noticed that you advocate uh, towards uh, the development of simple heuristics um, and uh, we have seen, you know, in our community, a lot of uh, strange meta heuristics, uh, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, right? So yes. what's your opinion on, on this metaphor based meta heuristics and what can the scientific community do to prevent the bestiary <laughs> to keep growing? Bestiary, yeah, we've put together uh, a bestiary, not, not uh... Well, a while ago already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's another of these biases that we have in in 
we, we talked before about sophisticating algorithms for the sake of impressing referees and another another different tangent to that is trying to mimic uh, biological processes or physical processes or whatever process because it's I think it started with genetic algorithms because when you explain how a genetic algorithm goes and, and you explain oh it mimics the natural evolution no it does not it's it's just you have a set of solutions and you shake them and somehow cross them but it has nothing to do with with the with the evolution of a species right it's but that's kind of cool it's very similar to artificial intelligence right we like it so much because oh computers think computers think computers don't think no more than submarines swim right so and this is another bias and people starting doing particle swarm optimization and then cuckoo search and then uh, intelligent water drops and, and very, very weird things. And then when you look at the algorithms, it's just the same ideas over and over. It's basically initial solutions, some type of local search, some diversification, some intensification, and that's it. And you can broadly categorize all the algorithms in two, three broad categories, and you're done. So all these things about, it's like the, the the final outcome of the research is not the application or solving a real problem or a theoretical problem. It's just creating a new algorithm for the sake of creating a new algorithm, which is not really new. And this is becoming a real problem. So we have been fighting as editors and referees and all over the place as much as we can to really stop this because I don't think it's serious from people from other disciplines to come at our doorstep and and they see that we are doing firefly optimization algorithms. What do you mean a firefly? And it's, uh, no, yes, we, there's a worm and then the worm becomes a firefly and, and flies out. What? It's, we are solving combinatorial or continuous optimization problems. What is your strategy? What are the steps of the algorithm? Be done with it. So I think it's a problem and we just have to be more serious about rejecting this research where the objective of the research is just creating a new method. The, the, the methods are tools. We don't need more tools. We, we just no, need to solve the problems that are, are out there. Yeah. The, to, the tool is not important. It's mm -hmm. not important. I see that this is more common in journals that are not directly or are related, I suppose. Uh, so shouldn't we make an effort to 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 uh, not exactly to convince, but to to make the editors of these other journals more aware of uh, the damage this uh, you know this type of algorithms or this type of meta heuristics can cause. Uh, you know, introducing a lot of noise, and you know, also it's maybe encouraging not so good research practice. So, what can we do? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. We have reached out editors of journals that are more in the computer science area, artificial intelligence area, and they don't see the problem. They just see papers that look OK and lots of referees that like those papers and they write good reports. So we come to them telling them, look, this is really not cool and this is not helping. This is adding lots of noise. We don't need a sperm whale optimization algorithm. Really, we don't. And they so they tell us, what are you talking about? I have three positive reports from three reputable referees in my area. So the problem is that we have been doing this for long enough so that the body of literature is already very big. Yeah. The, the best theory has probably 300, 400 entries yeah. by this point and lots of hybrids. If you count all the hybrids, then it's probably thousands of thousands. Many of these papers do get lots of citations as well. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to fight this horde. It's like a zombie apocalypse. It's, it's, it's lots of them. But there is agreement in the meta heuristics community, the, the, the people that really study meta heuristics, that this is completely unnecessary. And we are trying to write letters to, to editors, trying to convince them to have an editorial approach to not accept this this type of uh, research and trying to convince also referees and conferences and 
I want to think that in the best OR journals, those things are not published as easily mm -hmm. as they were before. But I don't know. We have to stay vigilant. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so let's switch topics now a little bit. Uh, how was the experience of co-sharing uh, the Euro conference in 2018? Oh, yes, Euro conference in Valencia in 2018. So that was a very, very, very interesting uh, period of my life. I've, you know, we have talked about me teaching and, and doing the PhD at the same time, mm -hmm. working in the night and studying in the day. I have never worked as much in my life as when I was preparing that conference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was incredible. That was such a huge amount of work and I uh, there were two co-chairs of the organizing committee Ramon Alvarez Valdez from the University of Valencia and myself from the Polytechnic University because it's such a huge conference that a single university cannot really take it uh, at the scientific committee we had Greet Vandenberge which you uh, interviewed not yeah. long ago lovely person she was she was incredible I've never seen a person with a heart with higher bandwidth of it's it's incredible uh, Ramon and myself had the brilliant idea of not having a professional conference organizer we wanted to do everything ourselves because these companies are so expensive and they take a huge chunk like two-thirds of your budget go to this company and we wanted to have you know more uh, social program better food and things like that in hindsight, I don't think that was the brightest idea because organizing everything ourselves, oof, it was the first time in my life when emails were coming at a faster pace that I could answer them. Uh -huh. I would sit nonstop for six hours answering emails. And after those six hours, I had a thousand emails in the inbox. It was incredible. <laughs> It's such a huge amount of work. Yeah. People complain about conferences, but you really have to go through that to understand the amount of work that is involved wow. in, a, in a large conference. I've organized smaller conferences and, and yeah, it's, it's nonlinear. <laughs> Let's say it's <laughs> nonlinear. The amount of work is nonlinear with the, with the number of attendees. Wow. But, but I, I really enjoyed, uh, I learned a lot met a lot of people, very hardworking, enthusiastic people. And I felt I was much more connected to the OR community after organizing this conference. Yes. Yeah. So do you think that was a turning point in your career? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's very big event and not so much for m my career, but my growth mm. as an or scientist uh, and as an individual in the field. Right? So that like, definitely had an impact on you, for sure. Yes, yes, it had an impact. I, I don't think I had any, any impact on the community, but but surely organizing the conference had an <laughs> impact on me. Yes. OK, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, now, so talking about impact, uh, I was wondering, uh, what's your take on, you know, academic indicators such as age index and impact factors? <laughs> <sighs> I'm, I, I'm a very happy person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm answering a lot of a lot of your questions with negativity, but <laughs> I don't think anybody could be happy with an impact factor. I, I summarizing the career of a person in a single number is such a dumb idea. In this it's, case, you mean it, H index, right? Uh, yes, uh, H index. I mean, it's such a stupid measurement. It, it, it is. I mean. And I can complain with from a position in which I, there, is, there are some studies in Spain that tell me I'm the highest age index author in Spain. And wow. then I use this to say, I use this to say, this is a clear demonstration that that index is wrong. Because I have many colleagues in Spain that are much better than I am, that I completely take them as my mentors and they have a smaller age index, which means it's a stupid, it's a stupid indicator. And then all over Europe, it is used for promotions. It is used for accreditations. 
And then the impact factor is used for the journals and we all live, live and die by it. Completely idiotic. Pretty much as this is stupid meta heuristics being published. <laughs> we can do much better. If we want to decide when a person has to promote to whatever position, read the science that this person has published. Oh, that's very expensive. Then how you're going to measure it? By how many papers has this person published? Then everybody starts publishing lots of papers in, in strange journals. It's the Goddard law. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything you use for performance measure measurements is going to break. So read the science. Uh, pretty much like you read a paper when you do a, a report as a referee, right? Mm -hmm. Read this person curric curricula, read some of the papers, and then you will have a very, very well informed opinion about the impact this person is having in the field. And if this person has to promote or not, ah, it's H index is completely, we should remove it. Yeah. I see you're very vocal about that. Have you got into trouble for uh, you know, defending these positions, especially when it comes to promoting or hiring people in, in academia? Yeah, I say my actions are as bold as my mouth is big. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that I got into legal problems in my university. I even had to go to court because during a promotion for uh, some positions in my department, I was very vocal. I was in the committee and I was very vocal against counting beans. I don't want to give more points to people just because they have poor papers. Not all papers are the same. Uh -huh. And then we, the persons that published a lot of incremental papers were not very happy and they went to court and I had to go to court. Yep. This is something, I mean, I did lots of things, not just talking, to, to try to stop this, this nonsense of uh -huh. H index and, and counting beans. Uh -huh. But today in Spain, in order to be full professor, you need to have more than, I think it's 34 papers. <laughs> and then they, they revise that from one year to the other. Uh, uh, ANECA, it's a central government agency that decides if you can promote or not. Mm -hmm. And they count beans. They basically count the number of papers you have published. Completely idiotic <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what made you leave academia and join Amazon? I suppose that, this is that's, partially yeah, the motivation. That's <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's one motivation. I think I started not to enjoy publishing papers anymore. The thrill of the research, the thrill of solving a problem was no longer there. There was always a co-author, be a PhD or a young colleague that wanted to promote and everybody was always in a rush to publish papers. I just didn't have enough time to do the good science. I don't know how to do very good science very fast. If you do science very fast, it's not going to be very good. Uh -huh. So everybody wanted to publish lots of lots of papers. So I was not enjoying it anymore. It was like, why do I want to do this paper? Mm -hmm. And I was not finding the motivation anymore. At the same time, I found very hard to publish research about the real problems I was solving in industry because of referees saying, oh, but this is a very particular problem of a particular company. Nobody's interested in this. What do you mean? This is operation research. How can you compare is... your method with, uh, yeah. how can you evaluate your method if you cannot compare with uh, any other of course, it's the first oh, this, method for this the first is an application. Yeah. This is an application paper. You are applying a very simple algorithm for a very specific problem in a specific company. Yeah. yeah. To me, that's operation research. Uh -huh. So I couldn't really publish those. So I, th I, I, I was in a point where I was doing research on things that were unrelated to what I was doing at companies. Mm -hmm. And the research was no longer interesting. And Bureaucracy, bureaucracy, I like it to say bureaucracy, not bureaucracy. It was completely mad. It got to, put up to a point in Spain where it was madness. Being IP of a project or PI, sorry, it was a complete, a continuous stream of paperwork. And that, so I found myself doing work that I didn't enjoy most of the time. Uh -huh. So I thought, what do I want? What do I like? I like solving problems. 
So at that time, again, I got a call from Amazon. They were interested in me joining. And they explained to me what they were doing. And I was thrilled. And then I just left, left academia and joined Amazon. Right. Uh, so what type of problems are you currently working on at the company? If you can uh, share some of yeah, the... Yeah, I, I, I cannot go into very specifics, mm -hmm. but I can give generalities. So within Amazon, uh, there's, there's AWS, Amazon Web Services. So that's the cloud of Amazon. So we basically sell compute by demand, many, many services. Within the many services of AWS, there is EC2, Elastic Cloud Compute which is basically the business of renting virtual machines to customers. Instead of having on-premise servers, they rent the virtual machines and use the cloud. And I am solving what we call the, the virtual machine assignment problem. So I'm building algorithms to optimally pack virtual machines into servers. Uh -huh. So those are very nuanced and heavily constrained with many real things, uh, packing problems, beam packing mm -hmm. problems. So very, very, very interesting line of work. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. Simple methods again. Yeah, uh, this is the clear cut uh, situation in which nobody likes complicated methods. I mean, simple if they work. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't work, it's not a, it's not a method. It mm. doesn't work. It's, it's something that doesn't work. But if, if I came in my team to my manager tomorrow with an optimal algorithm, utterly sophisticated, and a simpler algorithm that was relatively far away from optimality, guess which one will be chosen? Would be chosen. The simple one. Mm -hmm. Because a complicated one cannot be maintained. Uh -huh. It's too sophisticated. And the problem is going to change in two weeks. New things coming up, pro new products coming up. You have to adapt the algorithm continuously and the model continuously. And if you do a very nice branch and bound with a very nice cut, how long that cut is going to survive when the problem changes, right? Uh -huh. I don't want to criticize those exact methods. They, are, uh, they serve as a very good inspiration for everybody. We need all that theory. We need all that exact uh, methodologies. What I'm saying is that we don't need 80% of that and 20% of real problems. We could, we could do with more practical applications. Mm -hmm. So you think that uh, applied papers are some, sometimes or quite often overlooked by the, the scientific community and that simplicity is underrated uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to judging uh, uh, a methodological uh, paper, right? I think that's not far from being the truth, actually. I even today, I mean, when I, I'm still doing some research works here and there and co-authors, oh, I thought about this. Okay, let's, let's test it because this is complicated things. No, but this is nice because then I can do a theorem, I can do a lemma. What do we need that for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think this, that's still true today. Mm -hmm. I think it's much easier to publish a heavily mathematically oriented uh, algorithm based on exact techniques than it is to publish a very simple heuristic in, in, in many journals in mm -hmm. our field, yes. Right, okay. Uh, so what are your plans for the future? Is there any chance that you would return to academia? Because you're on leave now, uh, technically. Yes, I'm on a, a leave of absence. That was uh, interesting also, going out of academia. That was really interesting. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm really enjoying a lot the work I'm doing. It's, it's like after 20 a lot years in academia, I'm finally doing what I always wanted to do, which is apply all my knowledge with real problems. I don't see coming back anytime soon, but there is something I miss. I miss the teaching. Uh -huh. I don't have teaching now. And working with the students 
you know, this moment when they open their, eye, their oh, eyes, yeah, when, yeah. When, when they understand something you're telling them, that's priceless. Absolutely. And I don't, I'm not doing teaching now, and I don't know if in the future I miss that a lot, I might come back at some time. Uh, I'm not coming back for the bureaucracy. I'm not coming <laughs> back to, to publish crazy meta heuristics, but I, 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 I would see, I, I could see myself coming back for the teaching, yes. Yeah, but you were in an interesting position. Uh, you were working at a very famous company. At the same time, you're still keeping your editorial work active. And uh, uh, and when you do operations research, uh, and as the name suggests, you are always doing research in some way or the other, right? So yes, yes. Amazon is very vocal about the scientists to to be active in science. Mm -hmm. So we are expected to publish. Uh, I was I was given the the compatibility to to be an editor, and it's actually something that is valued in my position mm -hmm. as a as an applied scientist within Amazon. And I think it's a good thing to do because sci if scientists have to keep doing scientists, they have the science, they have to be sharp, right? Yeah. And the only way of being sharp is 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 doing science. Yes. Because if all you do is only apply science and You'll, you'll become dull at some point and you will not be knowledgeable of the last thing. So I think I'm in a good position because I get to read all the papers I get as an editor. So it's a vantage point. I get to see the new stuff, the math heuristics, and I get to see all the nice stuff. And at the same time, I get to, to apply it in, in real problems. So yeah, I, I cannot complain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy now. Okay, Ruben, uh, it was great to have this conversation. I wish you could keep going, but uh, we, we have to stop at some point. So uh, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Ha sido un placer. Thank you very much, Anand. I think you are doing a very great job here because we need to sell operations re research much more than, than we're doing. And you're doing a very, very nice effort. So yeah. we, should, we should all be very thankful. It's like organizing the conferences. I don't think people realize how much work it takes to, to do all what you're doing. Uh -huh. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, thanks a lot. I appreciate your words. And I think we need more people uh, like you, more vocal, m with, you know, brave enough to speak out their mind and sometimes uh, you know, question the, the, you know, the status quo, you see, uh, I think Uh, if you want to evolve, if you want to change, if you want to make impact, if you want to make OR more popular, maybe we should uh, revisit some of our views and, and take inspiration from a lot of uh, your insights and, and hope for a better future regarding our field. That's beautiful. Yeah. I hope so. Yes. Uh, once again, muchas gracias. And I hope to meet you soon. And you're most welcome to visit us in João Pessoa in Brazil. And uh, um, even who knows, we can collaborate in the future. Sure. Likewise. I love that. Yeah. Gracias. Bye -bye. And uh, take care. Ciao. Bye. You too. Ciao. Bye bye.